Uh, today, I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about Elizabeth Bishop, and I'm also going to uh, try to give some big perspectives uh, on the poets we've been reading, and, and also uh, uh, some ways uh, of thinking about how they fit together. Um, let's, uh, let's look at, at Bishop's poem, Over 2,000 Illustrations, in a complete concordance. Uh, the poem placed second in her second book called A Cold Spring, <coughs> published in 1955. Uh, the latest poems that we'll discuss in this course. On, on uh, Wednesday, I talked about Bishop's poetics of geography uh, or travel uh, as, as a horizontal poetics, as opposed to the uh, uh, ascendant and sublime impulses uh, in uh, many of the poets that we have um, been examining this term. Uh, this poetics is uh, ultimately a, a poetry of, well, shifting perspectives and local perceptions. Uh, the question that uh, it immediately poses is, well, how do we put these perceptions and these points of view together. <coughs> uh, the, I think, uh, exciting but also uh, difficult uh, textures of Bishop's great landscape poems, Florida, Cape Breton, uh, At the Fish Houses, A Cold Spring, uh, and others all pose this uh, uh, very clearly to us, uh, this problem. Uh, you might see the grains of sand that the sandpiper uh, uh, searches through uh, in, in that little poem. Uh, sandpiper as, again, exemplary of this problem in Bishop, uh, that is, uh, how do we hmm, hold on to, organize, uh, find coherence in uh, a world of uh, discrete and, and shifting um, uh, phenomena? This is the, uh, um, really, the, the master problem uh, that Bishop addresses uh, very self-consciously in this poem. Uh, over 2,000 illustrations in a complete concordance. Uh, like the map, it's a uh, poem that, that uh, is in part about a representation. <coughs> um, she, uh, by implication, begins the poem by referring to a book, presumably the one uh, mentioned in the title, over 2,000 illustrations in a complete concordance. What kind of book is that? Uh, she doesn't specify, but as the poem unfolds, there's reason to believe it's a Bible, I think, <coughs> perhaps a family Bible. Uh, she says, thus should have been our travels serious, engravable. Uh, our travels, <laughs> our experience in the world, our experience of geography, uh, our experience as geography should have been, ought to be serious, it ought to add up to something. It ought to be engravable, something that, that might be bound in book form. Uh, the image of a book uh, with illustrations in a complete concordance uh, holds up uh, an idea um, that um, word and image, uh, perhaps word and flesh, uh, representation and uh, uh, experience might be bound together in a coherent unity, uh, might be uh, uh, shown to uh, uh, exist in, in, in concordance or in some kind of correspondence. Uh, against this ideal or this model of things, <coughs> where illustration and text are, are bound together, uh, Bishop poses her own wayward experience, her travels, which this poem will uh, list, uh, uh, record, uh, give us fragments of. Uh, what the poem reveals to us is a world of discrete fragments, uh, parts that gain meaning, if at all, uh, through their mere adjacency. <coughs> uh, or through the perceiver who holds them together, <coughs> uh, holds them together through the quality, 
of her attention uh, and the sensibility behind it. Uh, a form of attention for Bishop that is always pushing towards revelation, uh, seeking meaning, something beyond surface detail, <coughs> but never <coughs> quite arrives there, or never in that sense arrives at a place of repose uh, or rest uh, or home. Uh, let me read the, the second paragraph, which uh, brilliantly represents uh, the world uh, brought into being by this uh, poetics of geography. Entering the narrows at St. John, the touching bleat of goats reached our ship. <coughs> we glimpsed them, reddish, leaping up the cliffs among the fog-soaked weeds and butter and eggs. And at St. Peter's, the wind blew and the sun shone madly, rapidly, purposefully, the collegians marked, marched in lines, crisscrossing the great square with black, like ants. The poem is composed almost of the fragments of a travel diary or bits of a letter. Uh, and if you read Bishop's letter, you will indeed find observations uh, like this uh, on every page. <coughs> in Mexico, the dead man lay in a blue arcade. The dead volcanoes glistened like Easter lilies. The jukebox went on playing a uh, Jalisco. And at Volibulus, there were beautiful poppies <coughs> splitting the mosaics. The fat old guide made eyes. <coughs> In Dingle Harbor, and, and we, we jerk from one place to another uh, with each sentence, one country, uh, one spot on the map. <coughs> In Dingle Harbor, a golden length of evening the rotting hulks held up their dripping plush. The Englishwoman poured tea, informing us that the Duchess was going to have a baby. This is one of Bishop's provocative juxtapositions in the poem. And in the brothels of Marrakesh, the little pockmarked prostitutes balanced their tea trays on their heads and did their belly dances, flung themselves naked and giggling against our knees, asking for cigarettes. <coughs> It was somewhere near there I saw what frightened me most of all, implying, of course, that all of these scenes had frightened her. A holy grave, not looking particularly holy, one of a group under a keyhole arched stone baldachin, open to every wind from the pink desert. An open, gritty marble trough, carved solid with exhortation, yellowed, as scattered cattle teeth, half filled with dust, not even the dust of the poor prophet Paynim who once lay there, just dust, in a smart burnous, Kadur, presumably their guide, looked on amused. Looking at these, uh, looking at this, this series, uh, this uh, this way Bishop's life seems to add up. Uh, she continues ref reflecting on the poem and on uh, its uh, structure. Everything only connected by and, and, and. Open the book, and we're back to the book now, that ideal <coughs> form of uh, representation in which text and image are, are bound. The gilt rubs off the edges of the pages and pollinates the fingertips. Bishop wants us, as in the map, to, well, she, she wants the, the, the book as something that can be held and touched. Uh, she's a, a marvelously tactile poet, <coughs> along with the unity of experience that it promises to give us is, is a sense of intimacy, too, uh, with an object. Open the heavy book, she says to us. Why couldn't we have seen this old nativity while we were at it? The dark ajar, the rocks breaking with light, an undisturbed, unbreathing flame, colorless, sparkless, freely fed on straw, and lulled within, a family with pets and looked and looked our infant sight away. The nativity is the scene of the incarnation. Uh, 
that moment when the Word is made flesh, Christmas morning, uh, that moment when the divine takes human form and so uh, becomes present in the world. Uh, this is specifically here, as Bishop imagines it, a scene of revelation. That wonderful phrase, the dark ajar, as if the shadow were a door and you could enter it. Uh, the rocks breaking with light, that which is solid, opening. Uh, what emerges is a flame, a sign of spirit. But notice how, in this light, the sacred is secularized. What Bishop finds there is not the Holy Family, but a family with pets. There is uh, nostalgia in here, in this poem, poignant uh, and powerful. That is a nostalgia uh, not so much for the holy as for the family once constituted by their relation to the holy. The family with pets, but also the family that gathered around the book to look at them. Uh, a family gathered uh, through religious practice, uh, who might then have looked and looked our infant sight away. Uh, in that, uh, looking is a, uh, expressed a kind of primal longing <coughs> uh, for community, for human connection, a longing expressed through looking, importantly for Bishop which is really what the poet is doing in the map, I think, uh, and the way that she invites us into her act of looking in that poem. Uh, here, Bishop's nostalgia is sad, uh, but also resigned. Uh, this nativity <coughs> is a scene that can be remembered uh, and looked at from afar, but not entered into <coughs> as the belief system that it uh, comes out of and, and refers to can be looked at from afar but not entered into. Uh, Bishop, as several people remarked in section this week, uh, calls us back in lots of different ways to Frost. Uh, Frost is perhaps an unusual place to begin a course on modern poetry <coughs> uh, because, remember him? Uh, he really is uh, generally an exception uh, to the metropolitan scene and inspiration of modern poetry. Modern poetry is a poetry of the city, of the metropolis, of the world city, the place where the world's peoples, goods, languages, traditions, and cultures are all accessible, to use Marianne Moore's word from her poem, New York. <coughs> Uh, Pound, Eliot, Crane, Moore, Hughes, even Williams and Stevens in their somewhat different ways are all poets of the metropolis. Uh, the sense of ambivalence about modernity in these poets uh, is an ambivalence in many ways about the city and what it uh, <coughs> promises uh, and also what it in many ways uh, threatens us with. Their sense of uh, experience, their visions of modernity and of modern forms of community are all located and expressed there. <coughs> Frost aggressively defines his work against that context. Uh, in doing this, he links his writing to 19th century American writing and art, uh, links his writing to rural culture, <coughs> which dominates the 19th century. There is a, an anti-modern strain in Frost, just as there is in Yeats, uh, and uh, more complexly in Pound and in Eliot. What's modern about Frost uh, is what has changed in the rural cultures that he writes about. Uh, that is, the collapse of farming economies uh, and communities and the decay of 19th century Protestantism, the white church, on the village green, 
you feel that loss in the uh, terrific aloneness of Frost's people. The great poem, Directive, uh, is about all of these things. Uh, Frost's poetry struggles to incorporate the secular truths of modern science and uh, to make poetry, uh, to make poetry like science, a disenchanted knowledge. In this way, uh, Frost has a lot in common with Auden. Uh, and Frost, again like Auden, is fundamentally concerned with poetry as a form of knowledge, a way to know the world. At the same time, uh, poetry preserves for Frost certain uh, archaic, uh, primitive powers of enchantment, powers associated with primitive motives, childhood experience, that make it a crucial alternative to science and scientific knowing. Think of the magic trick at the <coughs> end of Directive, when uh, Frost takes us to the ruined house of 19th century culture, <coughs> the ruined farmhouse of home burial, maybe, and steals from the abandoned children's playhouse a broken drinking goblet like the grail, and uses it to invite us to drink from a primal source too lofty and original to rage that spring, and in drinking to be whole again beyond confusion. What are we drinking there then at the end of Frost's poem? This poem published the end of the Second World War. We're drinking a kind of elemental power uh, that seems to fuse language and longing and imagination. Uh, this is in Frost a conscious rewriting, I think, uh, partially even a send up as well as uh, a competition with. Eliot in the Wasteland uh, and the grail myths that are one of the central motifs of that poem. <coughs> one of the central motifs that embody for Eliot uh, a sense of the holy, uh, uh, which is present, however, for Eliot uh, only through literary illusion, <coughs> something fascinating but unavailable. <coughs> Uh, as actual experience, uh, something available only, in a sense, as quotation. Poetry, uh, in Frost, as in Eliot, does the work religion no longer does. Uh, but notice how, in Frost, indirective, uh, the belief that poetry asks from us is a belief in a fiction, in make-believe. Uh, and in this, uh, Frost is uh, strangely and wonderfully and surprisingly, perhaps, fully the contemporary of Wallace Stevens and Hart Crane, <coughs> whose work uh, proceeds from that same assumption. <coughs> Stevens' uh, wartime poem, Asides on the Oboe, uh, begins, uh, The prologues are over. It is a question now of final belief. So, say that final belief must be in a fiction. It is time to choose. Uh, this is the theme of Stevens's wartime masterpiece, Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction. I notice the contradictory impulses in Stevens's title. Uh, when, when poetry takes the, the place of religion for Stevens, it presents itself as a supreme fiction, uh, a total representation of the world and experience. But we only have partial provisional access to that fiction. What Stevens gives us is merely notes. Uh, <coughs> notes, something that Elizabeth Bishop might present us with too. Uh, in this sense, in Stevens, the shift from religion to poetry is also a shift from totalization, uh, from system to contingency and incompletion uh, to parts uh, rather than uh, a whole. <coughs>
Chris Stevens, uh, the disappearance of the Christian God as the center of uh, emotional and spiritual cultural life <coughs> uh, is essentially, however, a cause for celebration. In Eliot, it's a cause for mourning, uh, mourning and anxiety, <coughs> uh, distress. In Yeats, it's a cause of fascination and horror. Uh, in Crane, for the making of new myths, new metaphors. Hughes's secular poems are Christ-haunted. Uh, Christ, in all of the uh, iconography associated with him, is a source of hope and also irony for black culture and a reproach to the white world. How do people, how does culture find bearing uh, in a world without divine sanction? This is played out, uh, played out as an ethical question, a question about how to live and act rightly uh, in Moore and then later in Bishop. Uh, in general, uh, it is a less urgent question, a less central one in the later poets than in the earlier ones. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, Yeats says in The Second Coming. E Bishop is uh, fundamentally at home in this condition, which is a condition of centerlessness or homelessness. She liked the, the phrase, uh, the world's an orphan's home in Moore. Uh, <coughs> Bishop is uh, at home then with a certain kind of homelessness. Uh, travel as her metaphor for the no mobility of consciousness uh, in a world without a stable center. Her poetry is written from the uh, disur disturbingly and disorientingly uh, decentered point of view that we find already in those early poems of hers, a point of view that takes for granted the absence of central authority that religion once provided. Remember in over 2,000 illustrations in a complete concordance, that holy grave? It's not even particularly holy, <laughs> she says. Uh, the place of the sacred in Bishop has been vacated. <coughs> Might poetry fill it? This isn't a question Bishop asks or is concerned with, but it is, as I've been suggesting, an urgent one in many ways for the poets who preceded her. Uh, the poetry of the period 1910 through 1940, say, uh, really the, the uh, um, uh, great phase of modern poetry. Uh, this period is, is structured, I think, by two big questions. Uh, how should poetry be written? And what can it do? What can it accomplish in the world? <coughs> in the first lecture, uh, I talked about these different impulses, <coughs> which are uh, at once opposing, but also, I think, related and interlocking. Uh, I called one of them uh, formal and inward turning, <coughs> an aesthetic. Uh, the other, rather outward turning, uh, concerned with the moral, the political, the social. <coughs> the first one tends to limit the definition of poetry, to say what is particular to this art, to uh, isolate what is essential to it. The other, works to extend poetry's scope, uh, to give it an expanded role in culture, in the world, <coughs> in our lives. You see different versions uh, of both of these impulses in the <coughs> career trajectories of H.D. and William Carlos Williams, uh, who begin as uh, masters of a certain kind <coughs> of uh, uh, short poem <coughs> and go on to create uh, epic poems uh, 
of uh, cultural sweep, uh, HD's being called Trilogy, Williams's Patterson. But the poet who more than any embodies these, these two uh, impulses uh, in the shape of his uh, career is Pound, of course, uh, as I said, the author of the shortest and the longest poem uh, in modern poetry, uh, the uh, exponent of imagism, and uh, the author of the cantos. Imagism seems to want to get outside of history, to explore the sudden liberation from space limits and time limits, Pound says, in a kind of autonomous aesthetic experience. The Cantos, however, are a poem, as Pound called it, including history, a poem uh, of the greatest possible range and scope uh, and ambition. In Imagism, there's an attempt to uh, establish uh, the primary poetic unit, uh, to cut away what is inessential, uh, uh, to uh, find uh, what is true. <coughs> Uh, this is a, a kind of formal program that expresses a drive towards truth-telling that we find in somewhat different terms in Frost and Auden and Moore. <coughs> uh, think of Frost's sense of fact versus in mowing the uh, 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 easy gold <coughs> at the hand of Fay or Elf. Or uh, think of Yeats's stylistic transformation as expressed in that short poem, A Coat, uh, or the Fisherman poems from 1915. Uh, think about Moore's and Auden's severe revisions uh, of their work, uh, in each case involving cutting out poems or cutting away uh, uh, many lines uh, in order to arrive at what Moore called in poetry, that poem subjected to severe revision, the genuine. Uh, these are all creative acts of, I think you could say, self-limitation. <coughs> uh, and uh, they're linked to uh, the general recurrent uh, theme in these poets, um, uh, in these poets in particular, Auden, Moore, Frost, <coughs> uh, to the general theme of restraint or reticence. The deepest feeling always shows itself in silence, not in silence, but restraint. Uh, remember Auden's stone god that never was more reticent, always afraid to say more than he meant. Uh, this impulse that I'm describing in modern poetry is also related uh, to formal experiments uh, uh, with res restraint. Uh, you, you, you see this worked into uh, Moore's syllabics. <coughs> uh, modern poetry in many ways uh, seeks to restrain the singing voice and the lyric voice of romantic poetry as received <coughs> through 19th century poetry. Frost's vernacular uh, uh, his, his, his will to get the sound of sense into uh, his poems uh, functions in this way. So does Hughes's vernacular, his black speech. Uh, think about uh, Eliot's syntactic and logical discontinuities and disjunctions, uh, the way they uh, interrupt uh, and, and fragment uh, lyric utterance. Or Think about Pound's incorporation of blocks of prose, as he did uh, in the cantos. Uh, there is, in uh, all of these examples, a tendency uh, to define what is modern and modern poetry by the incorporation of traditionally non-poetic forms of speech and language use, and moreover, and importantly, <laughs> non-traditional uh, methods of organizing poetic language. At the same time, this impulse can be seen as a way not of, of uh, uh, limiting or curtailing poetry's scope, but rather the opposite, expanding it, expanding it to include uh, even, as Moore puts it, school books and business documents, making poetry available uh, for people and cultures and experience that had not previously been represented in poetry. 
other modern poetry is experimental in a very different way. Uh, indeed, in its uh, uh, revival and recovery and incorporation of uh, historical poetic forms. You could understand uh, Hart Crane's reclaiming of uh, Elizabethan and um, uh, 19th century uh, uh, forms of, of uh, ornamental rhetoric uh, and uh, versification as exactly this kind of uh, uh, reclaiming of uh, archaic materials. There's something similar going on in, uh, in Pound, in, the, in Pound's recovery of Provençal and Anglo-Saxon uh, verse forms, his, his revival of these uh, forms. Pound and Crane are both heroic poets. Uh, they answer that question, what can poetry do, what can it affect in culture, by saying simply, everything. Uh, that's really the extraordinary uh, presumption of their long poems, the bridge and the cantos. They are very different poets, uh, however, <coughs> and to some extent expo uh, exposed, you know, opposed figures. Although, indeed, uh, their, 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 uh, their claims for poetry make, made them both uh, uh, exposed uh, uh, figures <coughs> um, in, in uh, uh, poignant and complicated ways. When I talk about their difference, I'm thinking of Pound's suspicion of rhetoric, uh, his suspicion of representation, his kind of will or drive to get beyond these things, uh, versus Crane's faith in rhetoric, uh, faith in rhetoric and imagination, uh, and their power to transform the world. In a sense, you couldn't have two more different poets. But both of these poets take poetry as a kind of metaphor, uh, as not only a metaphor, but as, a, as the salient instance of the creative impulse in history. What makes history happen? <laughs> what makes uh, action uh, in history? Uh, and they place poetry uh, at the center uh, of all that is most important that we do. They both propose that poetry can fulfill the central mediating functions that religion once did. Pound and Crane become cautionary figures for later poets. Uh, to some extent, Yeats does, too. Uh, that is, uh, figures who seem to show the limits of poetry precisely in their efforts to expand them. Uh, this is one way we can understand uh, Bishop's poem, Visits to St. Elizabeth's, on page 133. <coughs> uh, this is a poem that describes <coughs> Bishop's periodic visits to Ezra Pound in St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where Pound was uh, institutionalized, incarcerated, <coughs> uh, after his return to the United States on charges of treason. Uh, Bishop was living in Washington as the poetry consultant to the Librarian of Congress, and it befell her almost as an official duty to uh, visit Pound, uh, hear him talk, and bring people to Pound. <coughs> uh, and it became uh, the occasion for this poem, uh, built on the form of, this is the house that Jack built. <laughs> Say, this, is the, this is the poetry that Jack made. This is the house of Bedlam. This is the man that lies in the house of Bedlam. This is the time of the tragic man that lies in the house of Bedlam. And she continues adding each time, adding and, of course, in Bishop's uh, distinctive manner, not only repeating but revising <laughs> the terms that she's given us. Uh, again, uh, you know, a poetics of constant <coughs> readjustment. Uh, as the uh, poem builds, uh, characters are included, um, not only uh, Pound, but uh, Pound represented as the man, but also a soldier, a boy, a Jew, uh, figures that are versions of Pound, perhaps. <coughs> 
reaching a climax uh, in the final stanza. This is the soldier home from the war. Perhaps that's Pound in some sense. Uh, these are the ears and the walls and the door that shut on a boy that pats the floor to see if the world is round or flat. Again, Bishop touching a map. <laughs> this is a Jew in a newspaper hat <laughs> that dances carefully down the wall ward, walking the plank of a coffin board with the crazy sailor that shows his watch that tells the time of the wretched man who lies in the house of Bedlam. It's a great poem. Uh, I spoke of Auden's and Bishop's perspectivism. Uh, here, Bishop gives us multiple perspectives on Pound and, by extension, on the social and political ambitions of modernist poetry. Pound is tragic, talkative, honored, old, brave, cranky, cruel, and finally, simply wretched, a word that comes from the seafarer. Arguably, uh, one strain of modern poetry ends here in 1950 in the madhouse in Bedlam. Importantly, though, it is not that Bishop stands apart from, in a position to judge, Pound. Instead, she is interestingly, I think, implicated in the scene. Uh, she must have enjoyed and, by her choice of title, calls attention to the irony that Pound is uh, in a madhouse that has the same name as Bishop. <coughs> uh, in Bishop's great war poem, Roosters, uh, there is a sense that uh, to uh, oppose uh, conflict uh, out in the world, one must uh, encounter conflict in oneself. Uh, here, too, uh, I think, in multiple ways, Bishop implicates herself in the objects of her critique and satire. Uh, the child's verse form, it's important. Uh, Bishop identifies with, I think it's fair to say, she's certainly interested in children throughout her poetry. Uh, this interest points, I think, to Bishop's sense of herself as a minor poet. That is, <coughs> um, a map maker, uh, not a historian, a poet who refuses to write the major, culturally central, aggressively uh, uh, ambitious poetry to which modernism, and above all, the poetry of Pound, aspired. Uh, Auden's perspectivism in Musée des Beaux-Arts seems to position the poet and poetry similarly. So does that famous statement uh, in the Yeats elegy, for poetry makes nothing happen. Uh, these poems, Musée des Beaux-Arts, in memory of W.B. Yeats, read like rebukes to modern poetry's Promethean ambitions, its uh, verticality, uh, if you like, uh, rebukes to, to Auden's own political poetry of the 1930s, exemplified by a poem like Spain, 1937. Uh, but, uh, as I stressed, Auden doesn't put a full stop on that sentence, for poetry makes nothing happen. Rather, he punctuates it with a colon and continues, it survives. Uh, there is perhaps a double implication here. Either <coughs> poetry does not have an effect in the world, but still survives, <coughs> despite its lack of making something happen, or it survives because it makes nothing happen. It is not a cause, uh, and it doesn't take up causes effectively. What it does, rather, as Auden represents it here, is create a space, a space of happening, uh, a landscape, uh, uh, a model of the world, seen in the same time uh, uh, as a valley and a river, the river that flows 
through it. <coughs> There's terrific power of affirmation uh, in this claim about poetry's survival at the moment of Yeats' death, at the moment uh, of the uh, onset of the Second World War when all the dogs of Europe bark. Uh, ultimately, in Auden, uh, poetry survives as a way of happening, as he calls it. That is, uh, a way in the sense uh, of both a method and a path, uh, and uh, implicitly, uh, as I suggested talking about this poem earlier, uh, it survives as a kind of open space, <coughs> a place to come into, uh, to uh, collect in and gather in uh, for us. Uh, and it is figured, I think, uh, finally, implicitly, as a mouth, uh, uh, the human mouth, open to speak. Uh, old words and, and new words, too. Uh, poetry survives in, in my mouth uh, and also in yours, uh, which seems like a good last sentence to end this course with. So, thank you very much.